morning, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. We've got a lot to cover today, so we'll get right to it. First, as you know, Vermont continues to be a national and global leader in vaccinations. This is due to the hard work of hundreds of people, including volunteers, staff at AHS, Department of Health, Public Safety, EMS teams, the National Guard, local partners, businesses, and so many others. Most importantly, it's because Vermonters have stepped up to do the right thing. As a result, last week we were able to move into step three of the Vermont Forward Plan, over two weeks ahead of schedule. We were also able to adopt the CDC's updated guidance for those who are vaccinated. And as I said on Tuesday, no state was in a better position to do so than Vermont. With every step we've taken during this long and difficult struggle, I've been inspired by Vermonters, their willingness to help one another and their communities. We're getting close to the end of this race with just a few more hurdles to overcome before we shift from emergency response to long-term recovery and normalcy. In early April, when we outlined how the Vermont Forward Plan would methodically ease restrictions and work our way back to normal, we were in a much different place than we are today. In just weeks, as our vaccination rate increased, cases fell about 75%. And more importantly, hospitalizations and deaths have reduced significantly. Why? Because vaccines work. And we're vaccinating faster than I think anyone imagined. We originally calculated that all restrictions could be lifted by the 4th of July based on projected vaccination rates. And because by then, anybody who wanted to be vaccinated could. And because Vermonters have answered the call, today I'm announcing an opportunity to eliminate all restrictions sooner than originally planned. Right now, we lead the nation with over 70% of the eligible population, those 12 and over, having received at least one dose of the vaccine. That's over 400,000 Vermonters. So here's my challenge to you. If we hit 80%, I'll lift any remaining restrictions and mandates that day. Admittedly, this would be an ambitious goal for most. And to be honest, most states won't come close to reaching it. But I believe Vermont can. We can show the country how it's done. To reach 80%, we'll need to vaccinate another 27,954 Vermonters. So if you're on the fence or haven't gotten around to making your appointment yet, now is the time. Because we have a chance to get back to normal faster, and it's never been easier to get vaccinated. To those who have already been vaccinated, you can still help. It could be as simple as offering a, uh, someone a ride, or helping them find the closest vaccination site, or telling them your story as to why you got yours. Employers, you can help by offering an incentive, or at least a few hours off to employees so they can get their vaccines, or by asking us to bring the vaccine right to your doorstep, right to your work site, right to your job site. The state will do its part as well. As you've heard us say, we're bringing the vaccine to the people, whether it's Church Street, North Beach, pop-ups and walk-in clinics from the Northeast Kingdom to Southern Vermont, job sites, colleges, and more. We're working to make it easy and as, ex as accessible as possible. Now, the people who can help us accel accelerate this timeline the most are those between the ages of 18 and 29, who've lagged behind in vaccination rates. I understand why some might not have felt the urgency yet, but now's your time to do the right thing. 
We're counting on you to help us lift restrictions early, including gathering sizes, masks, social distancing, the curfew at bars, restaurants, and social clubs, and the rest. Now is your time to lead us to the finish line. Now, to be clear, we'll be dropping all restrictions as planned by the 4th of July either way. Because at that point, every eligible person in Vermont who wants a vaccine will have had the opportunity to get one. Put this, to put this in perspective, right now, our seven-day average is about 2,500, which has dropped about 30 percent in the last week. So, for example, if from here on out we average 1,500 a day, we'll be able to lift remaining restrictions by June 8th. So let's keep our momentum going. Let's finish strong. Let's continue to show the nation and the world what this brave little state is capable of. With that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary French for our education update. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. Secretary Smith will provide a more detailed update on our vaccination program in general, uh, but I thought I would make some comments on how the program is going for our school-aged children. The effort to vaccinate our students in the 12 to 18 age group is going very well. Uh, this week, we hosted 73 clinics and schools or community sites across the state targeted at this age group. Parent interest has been very good, and our pediatricians and healthcare providers have been enthusiastically offering their support. As we have seen throughout the pandemic, Vermonters believe in the importance of education. And as a community, we come together to ensure all our students can be successful. I want to speak directly to parents and guardians of students in this eligible age group. It's important for you and your student to get vaccinated. Dr. Levine often explores the safety and efficacy of vaccines from this podium. So I will merely reinforce what he has already said. We know these vaccines are safe for children, and we know they are very effective in preventing transmission of the virus and serious illness. Getting vaccinated against COVID-19 brings big benefits to Vermont kids. As of May, more than 4,000 Vermont kids have been tested positive for COVID-19 since the pandemic began. And that has had a huge impact on our kids, their families, childcare programs, and schools. Getting our kids vaccinated will keep them safe and healthy and will stop the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. Getting vaccinated also means more freedom so kids can be kids. They can see their other vaccinated friends without worry, travel to visit family outside of Vermont, and skip the need to quarantine if they are ever found to be a close contact with someone with COVID-19. That's why it's important for this newly eligible age group to get vaccinated for their health but also for the health of other students who can't yet get vaccinated. So protect your family members, friends, and neighbors by registering for your appointment today. And if you're in the 19 to 29 age group, I would especially ask you to get, uh, step up and get vaccinated. Do your part to keep your younger siblings and friends safe from COVID-19. The Agency of Education will be asking schools to assist us in encouraging students and their communities to get vaccinated. In the coming days, we'll be providing resources and toolkits to our school districts to help them talk to their communities about the importance of vaccination. We are encouraging fun and innovative activities, bake sales, raffles, and other fun ways to celebrate folks coming out to get their shot. And we hope to distribute coupons for creamies to our school-based clinics next week. You might remember earlier in the year, Dr. Levine confirmed creamies are very healthy and generally very good for you. We have been communicating with our schools uh, to explain the new mask guidance. The CDC specifically exempted schools from this guidance, so schools will continue to follow our safe and healthy schools guidance. I will point out that our guidance and the CDC's recommendations provide the necessary tools to safely operate schools for full in-person regardless of the vaccination status of students. The distancing requirements of our guidance can be a logistical barrier but our schools can operate safely during this pandemic 
as they have demonstrated their ability to do so throughout the school year. We are advising school employees who do not work in schools, like school district central office staff, that they can follow the new Vermont guidance, and if fully vaccinated, are not required to wear masks when they're working in their offices. We have been working directly with districts to answer their questions and to assist them with specific questions as they come up. This is yet another moment of transition in our pandemic response, but we've worked through far more complex issues uh, previously. So I'm very confident the school year will end on a high note and that the end of the pandemic is in sight. Uh, that concludes my comments and I'll turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French, and good morning, everyone. I wanna start out by highlighting that we have reached a significant milestone. More than 400,000 Vermonters have been vaccinated. That is 74.9% of the eligible population. But as the governor mentioned, we have another very important milestone in our sites now, which is to vaccinate 80% of eligible eligible Vermonters to end the restrictions sooner. That means 80% of those 12 and above. We intend to achieve our goal by offering many convenient opportunities to get your shot, but we need those Vermonters who have not been vaccinated yet to step up and do their part. I will get to, to the strategy of how we will vaccinate at least 27,954 more Vermonters in just a few moments. But first, let's take a look at the overall um, uh, progress. According to the CDC uh, dashboard, 412,806 Vermonters have been vaccinated with at least one dose. Let me just go through the statistics because different people use different statistics. Uh, we are using those eligible Vermonters, Vermonters 12 plus with at least one dose, and that's 79.9%. The, the President Biden uses 18 plus as his benchmark when he says he wants to have 70 plus by July, by, uh, July 1st. We are at, if you use that number, uh, 18 plus with at least one dose at 78.9% and all Vermonters with at least one dose, 66.9, 66.2%. Uh, that includes Vermonters that aren't eligible to get the vaccine. Turning to those aged 12 to 15, more than 9,700 12 to 15 year olds have made appointments. I wanna remind everyone that consent is needed from a parent or guardian. You can sign up online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or you can call 855-722-7878 to make an appointment. If you avail yourself of the many walk-in appointments available around the state, and you are 12 to 17 years old, then you must be either accompanied by a parent or guardian that can give consent or have the completed consent form and checklist signed by a parent or guardian. Let's move on to our strategy. We are deploying a four-phase approach to reach out to Vermonters and attain the goal of vaccinating 80% of eligible population in Vermont. First, we will continue specific community events like North Beach yesterday and again today, and today in Lancaster, New Hampshire at the fairgrounds, it's a drive-through uh, clinic which by the way, comes with a free admission ticket to the fair, a pop-up clinic tomorrow on Church Street in Burlington, a vaccination event at Thunder Road on May 30th, followed by clinics at state parks on June 12th. We're also continue to organize barnstorming events. All of these events are for walk-ins. In addition to all of this, we have been reaching out to employers to host vaccine clinics at work sites. We are starting with the largest employers first. Included in this effort are restaurant, hospitality, and tourism workers. As you know, the first wave of vaccine clinics for restaurant, hospitality, and tourism workers has been completed, and we're organizing for the next wave in this, sec uh, in this sector. Please go to ACCD dot vermont.gov slash myvaccine or healthvermont.gov slash 
my vaccine. Again, accd.vermont.gov slash vaccine or healthvermont.gov slash my vaccine for the most up-to-date information. So as I said, we starting out with um, bringing the vaccine to these various events and at work sites. The second part of our strategy, we'll, we will continue our walk-in strategy at all of our locations. This means you can walk in, whether it's at a pharmacy, healthcare provider, or a school and get a shot. Third, we will be distributing vaccine to primary care physicians. It will start with Moderna, but expand to Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson when sufficient supplies are available of those two vaccines. And lastly, a renewed effort of vulnerable populations, including the homeless, those on probation and parole under DOC supervision, as well as those that have declined in our uh, incarcerated population. We're going to um, revisit them and see if we if they have any concerns and we can address those concerns. As you can see, the strategy is designed to reach out to as many Vermonters as possible throughout the state at the places they work, play, or live. I urge Vermonters to take advantage of the opportunities we pro will provide to get vaccinated. Help protect yourself, your family members, and your fellow Vermonters. I want to remind everyone that's listening and uh, viewing uh, that EMS and fire departments are kicking off their clinics at 31 locations across the state today through Sunday. The dates and locations are on the next three slides, and I'll start. I just want to. Uh, I just want to talk about these slides in a minute. Just want to spend a few moments because I think it's important. This is a. Uh, I just want Vermonters to get a sense of just how large of an event this is going to be. Um, they will have Johnson & Johnson vaccine available, and thanks to the Vermont Dairy Farmers and the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, who, um, because, because of their efforts, you can get a free creamy coupon when you get a shot. Now, how's that for an incentive? So just to start today, uh, Deerfield Valley, EMS, Jacksonville, Ver Vermont, Re Reedsboro Fire Department in Reedsboro, Vermont, Manchester Public Safety in Manchester, Vermont, if we can go to the next slide. Um, these start getting uh, quite numerous. Ludlow uh, Fire Department, the Cavendish Fire Department, Long Trail Brewery in Bridgewater, Woodstock Union uh, High School, doesn't say Woodstock Union, but it is Woodstock Union High School. I graduated from there. Woodstock Union High School in Woodstock, Bennington EMS Station, uh, the uh, Eastern Asian uh, Cuisine Restaurant in Rutland, Franklin Town Hall in Franklin, Thatcher Brook School in Waterbury, Maple Tree Place in Williston, Berry Town Elementary in Websterville in Berry, um, on Websterville Road in Berry the um, Newport EMS station in Newport, Vermont, and Newport EMS will also be in Johnson, Vermont. If you could just go to the next slide, please. Upper Valley Ambulance in Fairley, Bradford Fire Department in Bradford, Vermont, Wells River Fire Department in Wells River, Newbrook Fire Department in Newfane, Arlington Rescue Station in Arlington, Vermont, Pownall Rescue Station in Pownall, Vermont, Porky's Place and uh, Backyard uh, Barbecue in New Haven, Twin Union School, Plain Plainsville, um, Enersburg Public Safety, Orleans EMS Station in Orleans, Glover Town Green, uh, Glover Town Green in Glover, uh, Westmore North Beach, uh, Norris, Cot uh, Norris Cotton Center and in St. Johnsbury, and Morrisville Ambulance Station in uh, Morris Town, Vermont. This would be on the 23rd. So from the 22nd to the 23rd, there's a lot of opportunities for Vermonters to get vaccinated. And as I said, to have an opportunity to have a coupon for a creamy. And don't also don't forget our school-based clinics. Uh, families and children aged 12 to 17 can go to any site across the state that offers the Pfizer vaccine. All sites will be open to the public 
parents, guardians, and family members who are unvaccinated are also welcome to get their shot right along with their child. Again, we've scheduled over 100 clinics and 66 of them are in schools. You can find a list of the school-based clinics and make your appointments at healthvermont.gov slash my vaccine. You can also make an appointment on the Kinney's, Walgreens, and CVS websites. As I mentioned on Tuesday, we are still operating larger uh, vaccination clinics through our healthcare partners in the Vermont National Guard. But we are also, as you can see, transitioning to more localized and smaller settings to bring vaccines to Vermonters where they live and work. These may be smaller events, but just remember they are very important to achieve our goal of vaccinating 80% of eligible Vermonters. I will stop there, but there is no better time to get your shot. Please take advantage of the many opportunities we've presented to you today. You can sign up online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or you can call 855-722-7878 to make an appointment, or you can simply walk in. This is our shot, Vermont, to hit the goal of 80%. I will now turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you, Secretary Smith. I'll go off script for a second and just say that by the time this month is over, if you wanted to be vaccinated and couldn't be vaccinated, I can't believe it would be because there wasn't a location that would suit your needs. But if you find that there is yet something else that we haven't included, please call our call center and give your suggestion. As I mentioned on Tuesday, the data that matters the most to present to you is really vaccination. The figures show that 74.9% of Vermonters who are eligible to get vaccinated age 12 and up have gotten at least one dose of vaccine. We know our state's doing incredibly well, largely thanks to the many Vermonters who stepped up to get vaccinated. We're ahead of other parts of the country and quickly surpassing our own goals to reopen gradually and safely. Now let's remember why this is so important. Vaccination is our most important tool to stop the virus's spread. And we're seeing how much of an impact it really has as we see cases, hospitalizations, and deaths all decrease. These will probably be the last time I show these slides, but I'm showing them for the visual impact, not necessarily to uh, give you a long list of numbers. But here we are with our total cases, just over 24,000, and our deaths at 255. To give you an idea of what our cases have done, we're now past these very high peaks coming down to an area where most of the cases are in the 30s or plus minus per night, which we have not seen since way back here in the pandemic. On the next slide, just to get a sense of the number as well as the frequency of people in Vermont succumbing to this virus, you can see that the deaths are now lower counts and farther and few between. And I believe we're at down to six deaths in the first 20 days of May that have been reported thus far. It may be a little hard to see on the camera, but the lighter gray is the amount of testing we're doing in Vermont. We have come down from these peaks, which had the college population included, and now the colleges, of course, are ending their semesters, but we are still at a very respectable level of testing within the state uh, so that when we talk about numbers like the percent positivity of tests, we're not fooling ourselves into thinking we've taken care of a problem. We actually have a good handle on it. Last time we looked, the difference between Vermont, which is leading the country in testing, and the state that had the lowest frequency of testing the difference was about 25-fold in the number of tests done per day. And then finally, 
going along with that low percent positivity, uh, almost an absence of symptoms of viral illness like COVID, COVID-like symptoms or flu-like symptoms uh, in the state at this time, coming down from those peak areas where we were seeing uh, abundant cases. And then the final slide is more symbolic. Uh, we have no outbreaks in long-term care facilities at this point in time, or to, to say not in other congregate living settings either, such as our correctional facilities, um, et cetera. Thank you. <clears throat> So clearly the theme is that the more people who are vaccinated, the fewer there are to transmit the virus to others, including to our kids who are too young to be vaccinated yet. This means we in Vermont can really suppress the virus, keeping it at such low levels, it will have far less impact on all of our lives. Just consider where we were more than a year ago when the spread of the virus that was quite easily transmissible from person to person required that we stay home to stay safe. Now, because we have highly effective vaccines and rising vaccination rates of Vermonters and are nearly on the other side of the pandemic, we can give the opposite guidance for those who are fully vaccinated. Go outside. You can take your masks off and there's no need to physically distance. As they have throughout the history of vaccine-preventable diseases, from polio to the measles, with COVID-19, vaccines have made the difference between then and now. Not only is our state safer, but we'll be in a better position this fall and winter, when we're back indoors again, and other respiratory viruses begin to circulate, including possibly the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We also know variants of the virus are still circulating in the state and around the globe. They are not affecting us to a large degree. But as we know with this virus, things can change quickly. We simply don't know what's coming tomorrow, and the more people who get vaccinated now, the less we have to worry about it. So please join the more than 400,000 Vermonters who've been vaccinated so far. Your shot is waiting, and we will keep doing everything we can to get it to you. Every one of you who gets vaccinated moves us closer to the time of fewer restrictions when life will start to look more normal again. But I do acknowledge that we are now in a more of a transitional period, and, we say, and for many of us, we need to give some thought to what we do based on potential risks. As I've said before, vaccine works. If you're vaccinated, you're protected. You are at very low risk of getting the virus and of spreading the virus. And it means those who are not vaccinated, such as children, are also going to be less likely to come into contact with the virus. So they too are more protected. But I also know people are still navigating what they can do safely, whether it's with children or if they have a condition that weakens their immune system. I would urge you to think about your own circumstances, as you've been doing daily for over a year now. Are you outdoors? Is it crowded? Are you with people you know? What's the level of community transmission where you are? Well, in Vermont, across our entire state, the level of community transmission is very low. This can help make choices for yourself and your family. Do what you're comfortable with, and in time, it will get easier to live your life in the new normal. I want to share a few thoughts on some topics that have come up here recently. The first is I want to mention what I will call a paradigm shift that we are undergoing in the way we vaccinate. Up to now, we and many of those in the press have focused on avoiding wastage at all costs. And we've maintained a very low wastage loss rate, which is currently 0.2%. And we should always strive to keep that number as low as possible. But as we eventually transition vaccination to the healthcare system and try to meet the remaining people who are not yet vaccinated where they are, we must do everything we can to get them vaccinated. And that might mean opening a new vial, even if not all the doses can be used right away. We need to seize the moment 
any time someone comes to us for their shot, it may be that person's only chance to get vaccinated. We won't send them away without vaccine. We should still strive to make this a rare event in recognition of the fact that the rest of the world has such little vaccine and needs every possible dose they can get. And we're already seeing, seeing some positive news in helping us navigate these new waters. For instance, the Pfizer refrigeration longevity of the vaccine going from five days now to four weeks. New shipping sizes to allow for smaller batches. And hopefully in the future, more office-friendly numbers of doses per vial. To update you on another topic of interest, the FDA has now confirmed what I have said here previously. Antibody test results should not be used to evaluate your immunity status or protection from COVID-19, including after getting vaccinated. Antibody tests can play an important role in identifying individuals who may have been exposed to the virus. But as my own work group has advised, the current platforms should not be used to assess immunity. We hope there will at some time be a test that we could do used for this purpose, as it would be very useful for people who are immunocompromised and may not fully be protected after vaccination. We will continue to monitor news about this. I do anticipate before the year ends, we will have a valid and reliable test and we'll share that news when it's available. And lastly, a word about breakthrough cases in nursing homes and concerns of families for their loved ones and whether visitation may be postponed due to cases. A study and the most recent issue of the New England Journal of over 18,000 residents, 4,000 of whom were unvaccinated, in 280 nursing homes in 21 states looked at vaccination rates and subsequent case rates. 70% of the residents were fully vaccinated. I might add that's a number far lower than what we have in Vermont. Using both PCR and antigen testing, the investigators found that after one dose of vaccine, 4.5% of residents did test positive for the virus. The majority of them were asymptomatic. But after two doses, the number came down to 0.3%. Even those who were not vaccinated benefited. Their rate of infection decreased from 4.3% to 0.3%. I look at this as yet another example of the real-world effectiveness of these vaccines. And as the authors stated in their conclusion, our observation of a reduced incidence of infection among unvaccinated residents suggests that robust vaccine coverage among residents and staff, together with the continued use of face masks and other infection control measures, is likely to afford protection for small numbers of unvaccinated residents living in congregate settings. So again, another real world example of the power of these vaccines in the settings where the most vulnerable live. I'll now turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with Calvin Cutler, WCAX. Um, thank you, Governor. So I'm, I'm sure many people are probably relieved to hear this, this metric of our uh, potential reopening uh, date here. But I guess my question is, how will people get notified uh, if and when that happens? I'm just thinking, you know, when the CDC put out their mask guidance uh, a couple weeks ago, it caught a lot of people by surprise and businesses were left scrambling. So I guess how do we make sure that that doesn't really happen? Yeah, we're going to uh, we're going to attempt to let everyone know on a daily basis where we stand. So if we know that uh, we have 29,000 whatever um, vaccinations left to go at this point in time, uh, we'll give you a countdown on a daily uh, daily basis. So. Uh, up to uh, the media as well as anyone else will put it on social media and so forth and uh, and trying to let people know so they aren't surprised um, over the weekend or weekend um, earlier this week um, you vetoed uh, Senate bill 107 juvenile public records I'm wondering if you can explain your your rationale behind the uh, the veto yeah you know this wasn't um, criticism of the legislature uh, it became apparent to me 
um, that we're moving faster than the programs that we have in place uh, to allow an older population uh, to be treated as uh, young adults. Uh, so in thinking, it was fairly stark when thinking about this that we now will, in 2022, as described, a 20-year-old will be treated as a kid. Uh, and I don't believe that we've done enough uh, collectively, uh, the executive branch, uh, judicial branch, uh, legislative branch, to prepare us for this moment. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. We need to take a step back and reassess and make sure that we put the programs in place or we, uh, we, keep, um, we keep the age, uh, age lower, uh, at least at this point. So again, um, it was just a, um, a realization that I think we're getting going too fast on this at this point in time. And uh, we wanna make sure that we have everything in place uh, to do what we set out to do three years ago. From your view, I mean, what, what else needs to be done? What investments need to be made or what programs need to well, be created? Well, again, in, in uh, housing and in, in situations and the programs needed um, to uh, rehabilitate uh, those uh, younger uh, offenders. And so they don't all exist. And, and there's, you know, anecdotal uh, situations where it might be encouraging some who are uh, in uh, trafficking uh, illegal substances, drugs, and so forth, uh, to take on that role at a, at a maybe 18, 19, and soon to be 20 year olds that would go into a different court system. So again, we need to reflect on this, make sure that we go into this with our eyes wide open and make sure that we're uh, contemplating all of that. Thank you. Steve Longchamp, local 22, local 24. Uh, Governor, the, uh, the numbers, the unemployment numbers have come out. Um, it's looking a lot better, it seems, in the, in the service industry and some of those uh, re retail and a few other things. Uh, but the kind of blue-collar industrial uh, portions of the economy still seem to be lagging or are actually decreasing in, uh, in numbers of employed yeah. individuals. You know, again, I just want to remind everyone, we were in this situation pre-pandemic. I've talked about this a lot over the last four years, and it's one of our biggest challenges. We have an older uh, population, a demographic that's shifting older, uh, and we are losing our workforce. And that's, uh, that was a problem before the pandemic hit us. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, in some ways, the pandemic has uh, exacerbated uh, the situation uh, so that we um, are facing what we're facing today. So. Uh, again, we can't look at the unemployment numbers. We need to look at the employment numbers, the labor workforce, and uh, that continues to be challenging us today. That's why we have to make the investments that uh, the, it looks like the legislature will go along with that if the uh, budgets are passed today. Um, but, um, but trying to make those investments in those areas where I think will give us the, the, the best rate of return and, and attract more people into our state, um, which is what we desperately need to to you know bolster the workforce that include education and and all, all and, across across and the board. Re, yeah retraining education housing you know broadband trying to uh, revitalize our downtowns our rural areas of the state uh, build on the economy get get become you know a, a brighter uh, more beautiful state than we already are to attract more people we're the safest healthiest state in the nation but we can get healthier and safer, and we can uh, we can attract more people at the same time if we can have a an economy that works for them. We have to have the jobs available as well. Have you looked at numbers wise uh, the support for re-education of uh, workforce and um, you know technical centers, yeah. you VTC? Know, investing in uh, career technical education is important. Uh, we need to bolster the trades. Uh, we've seen that that's an area that. Uh, that uh, is really very lucrative at this point uh, and is a worthwhile career. So we're, we're looking at that. We're also, you know, we have to work with our employers. Employers uh, need to uh, train and retrain as well uh, so that uh, we're all working together uh, in the same direction along with our higher education. So it's all, everything's connected. Uh, we just have to, to make sure that we're doing this in the most cost-effective way. You know if the legislature 
sort of supported that? I b believe so, yes. I mean, I think we all, uh, again, understand the problem. We may have different approaches on how to get there, but uh, I think we all understand the problem. Thank you. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Good morning. Uh, about the legislature, do you have a budget deal with them? Um, are you are you okay with the $150 million pension buy-down, $150 million broadband bill? Yeah, again, um, we've been working with them over the last uh, couple of weeks, and, uh, and I'm pleased with the direction they've been moving, and it appears the budget that they've They've uh, shaken. Uh, they've uh, shook hands on, and will be presenting to their bodies uh, today and or tonight uh, as well. Is something that we can support, barring anything unforeseen that uh, we didn't see uh, in the uh, last-minute details. Um, the 150 million uh, reserve for the pension that isn't going to buy down the pensions unless there's uh, structural changes, from my uh, perspective. But this is just put in reserve. Um, that is is acceptable. Um, as well, uh, when you look at the, the broadband and housing packages, uh, we never wanted to spend it all in the first year. We just wanted to have a, a plan moving forward, kind of a blueprint as to what uh, you know what we laid out. We wanted the legislature to agree to. It appears that they're, they're the intent language that they put in the uh, in the bill in a separate section uh, spells that out, and it, it falls right in line with what we're thinking. Maybe maybe a little bit different in some. Some of the buckets, but uh, but for the most part, that's all I asked for, and uh, so they seem to have met uh, that uh, that request. So again, I think uh, this is something we can work with, and I appreciate the legislature moving forward with this and working with us. All right, uh, is there anything coming your way that you can't support? I don't know everything that is coming our way at this point. Um, there are still some some bills that could pass uh, today uh, in the the waning hours of the legislature, and we'll have to have to see. So, um, no huge uh, red flags at this point, but uh, but one never knows. And you'll be addressing each chamber tonight. Yes, whenever they uh, whenever they adjourn, you know, or whatever it is. Yeah, one yeah. may may adjourn this afternoon, tonight, or tomorrow. I'm just not sure, uh, but uh, but we'll be ready. Right. Yes. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Lisa, the Associated Press. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering, Secretary Smith. How well attended have the latest walk-in clinics been, like the one at North Beach? Are, are those 18 to 29-year-olds showing up at all for those? We've got to remember, Lisa, that we've never planned for these to be the mass vac sites that we, we've seen earlier in the pandemic. But at North Beach yesterday, and we're having another clinic today, it was uh, 105 people uh, were vaccinated there at North Beach. I will say this, we saw all demographics at, uh, getting vaccinated at North Beach. We were most happy, uh, of course, with the 18 to 29 year olds there, but uh, we have another clinic today. We'll see how it's going, but the report back to me, 105 vaccinated at North Beach across all demographics. Okay, thank you. And then I have a question for Commissioner Harrington. Um, you mentioned earlier in the week that um, that those technical issues with filing some unemployment claims over the weekend had been mostly resolved. Have, have all those issues been resolved at this point? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, to uh, our knowledge, they've all been resolved. There was one remaining issue uh, that we were putting the finishing touches on with our development team and our contractor uh, yesterday, uh, and that went in, went live or went into production yesterday uh, mid-afternoon. Uh, so we will also be communicating out uh, today to any other claimants who were unable to file because of that last uh, correction that needed to be made, um, that they can do so uh, over today, tomorrow. Um, if they're in the PUA program, they've got some extra time to do that as well. Um, but it was a it was a smaller portion of the the PUA population um, for that last change that needed to happen. 
Okay. Any idea how many people that affected? I don't. This is the population where if someone came into the PUA program very early on in the pandemic or through maybe a side door because um, they came, you know, they found another mechanism to come through either calling our call center um, where they were uh, manually uh, put into the PUA program. Um, they may have uh, bypassed uh, one of the initial questions on the application that asked if you were an independent contractor or a self-employed individual. Um, so it's certainly not the majority of the population because we know uh, almost all filled out uh, the complete online application. Um, however, there were there was a smaller population where we manually uh, had to put them in very early on. Uh, and so if that was the case um, and they didn't uh, they didn't get asked that question early on, um, then we weren't able to automatically have them bypass the work search requirement for self-employed and independent contractors. So that's, um, we've just simply added the functionality to the application when they file their weekly certification. Uh, they can select uh, that they are an independent contractor or a self-employed individual, uh, and that is under the, the COVID exemptions, uh, and then they'll bypass the work search. And we already know because we've seen some people who have already gone in as of yesterday and been able to do that without an issue. Um, so we know that's up and working, but it's a, it's a much smaller uh, subset of the population. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good morning, thanks for taking my call. Um, before I ask my question, Governor, I just want to say on behalf of the Vermont Press Association and many Vermonters, thank you. Thank you for the veto of S105. The bill would substantially reduce public transparency about serious crimes. The bill would have allowed criminal defendants up to the age of 20 to avoid public disclosures for a long list of serious crimes like DUI, fatal car crashes, domestic abuse, hate crimes, lewd conduct, embezzlement, and more. Your veto letter is very clear and thoughtful as to why the bill needs more consideration and that bigger societal issues have to be addressed here in Vermont. Thank you. We appreciate your attention to this matter. Thank you, Lisa. And my question is a data question for Commissioner Pichek. I see he's not on the, um, the list today. Perhaps someone can forward my question to him. I note that. that other states are beginning thank you. I note that other states are beginning to monitor uh, cell phone mobility data, and I'm curious if Vermont has any intention of providing updated cell phone mobility data for Vermonters as well as for those in the Northeast. We, we do have that, uh, or we have been keeping track of that early on when we were doing our, our travel modeling. So um, I'm sure that we have that uh, and we're keeping up with that. So I will make sure that uh, Commissioner Pichek gets that and gets back to you. Great. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Okay. Thanks. Mike Donahue, the Islander. One question, Governor. <clears throat> Vermont uh, continues to meet or beat your timetable to return to normal. Uh, one reader is interested in the date on when state of Vermont government offices will be back to normal and full operation. And, and maybe related to that, are, are the state employees that were like on loan to um, like the Labor Department and others to answer phones and do things where there was some crunch time. Um, are they back to their old jobs and at old desks, like at ANR or uh, AOT or whatever? Uh, are they? Is everybody back where they should be? Or yeah, I, and, I, I, and I, when will they be if they're not? <laughs> I wouldn't say uh, they're all back. In fact, I was uh, we were on the uh, SEOC uh, call this morning, the Emergency Operations Center call this morning. And there were three uh, from one department that were leaving the health department, as a matter of fact, uh, and going back to their regular duties. So uh, we're still seeing, seeing some reshuffling uh, because we're you know, transitioning out of this state of emergency ourselves. For, for the most part, I think everyone is back into their normal agencies and departments, but we still you know, need help in certain areas. 
Um, so we'll continue to do that uh, as uh, time allows and as the emergency continues uh, to transition to normalcy. Um, in terms okay, of, uh, good. Uh, you were wondering about when state offices would be back uh, to, I think, being open, uh, that they are open. Um, they have been since the beginning. We haven't really closed anything, but we've changed uh, services. So if you're talking about more in-person, um, that we'll be transitioning uh, back to some of that in person at this point in time. Um, but, um, but possibly if she's on, Secretary Young uh, could uh, talk about the, um, the email she sent out yesterday, I believe, to state employees. She may not be on. Okay, she's not on uh, right now, uh, Mike. But I can uh, I can share that with you uh, when when we get back, or I have her get in touch with you. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. No, that'd be great. And and if there was a way to figure out like how many people are are not back at their jobs, I don't know if human resources or she would be able to figure out. Yeah. The, I mean, we have some numbers, just, just so that everyone understands, we have some that are even at vaccination sites. Um, so we want to continue to vaccinate and we've talked about this aggressive schedule here. So we're still using, you know, we've broken down these silos, which is the silver <laughs> lining of this pandemic and be able to use the, uh, the, the state workforce in many different ways. So uh, right now we need help in making sure that we're getting vaccines in arms of, uh, of uh, Vermonters. And so we're, you, we're still using some of those people in different areas. So um, that's why we're not, we're not back to quite normal, but, um, but uh, we'll try and get that information. I'm just not sure if we have it in one, one area or not, but we'll, we'll check it out and get back to you. <clears throat> okay. And thank you. And thanks for the clarification. Yes, I knew state government was operating. I should have been a little clearer that I, what the question really was. Yep. Back to normalcy of, of, of that, not uh, you know, that people can walk in. Yeah, we may, we may not ever, we, you know, that. we've learned a lot uh, during this pandemic, and we may not be back to what some would assume to be normal. We've, we might be able to be more efficient in the way we do things. So, it may be different, but it'll be bit back more to normal than it has been over the last 14 months. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. You too. Appreciate it all. Greg Lamoureux, the county courier. You there, Greg? All right, we'll move to Liam from DPR. Hi, uh, I had a question about some of the vaccine data that we have. Um, there's a story in Kaiser Health News uh, today about just state by state um, disparities in vaccination rates along uh, like racial disparities. And in Vermont, they had that uh, according to the CDC data, they would gotten that 90%, 97% of the data the CDC had, they didn't know the race or ethnicity of the people in Vermont who'd received the shot. And I know our state data, um, I believe, said that something like 9% is unknown. And so I'm just kind of wondering if you know what the discrepancy is or if your state data is capturing something or counting uh this information in a way that the CDC data is not. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, Secretary Smith can answer that. I, I do. I was reading an article, another national article, where they were giving us high marks uh, for all we've done in the uh, racial equity uh, sector. So uh, we were actually leading by their uh, by their measure. So I, I don't know where the where everyone's getting the information or not getting the information. I'll Secretary start. Smith. I'll start and then. Thanks. I saw the same article, too, and yesterday I asked a, a question on this. And the way that the CDC asks the question, um, in, in some regards, we can't give them the information that they want. 
Um, we do track in aggregate. The way that they break it down and the way that they want it broken down violates some of our uh, some of our laws here in Vermont. And I'll, uh, if Dr. Levine has more spe uh, specifics about that. So we didn't, um, we, we, we don't supply the information that they want. I think there are six or seven states that don't uh, supply the information in the format that they want. Now we do it in the aggregate on our dashboard and as, as the governor said, we're doing quite well in our, in our um, BIPOC community in terms of uh, vaccination. I think the disparity between uh, white non-Hispanics and the BIPOC uh, community is like 5.5%. Now, if you remember, that used to be about over 13%. We have driven that number down quite substantially, mostly through uh, large help of the BIPOC community and uh, various members of uh, associations that help the BIPOC community, but also specialized clinics, uh, as well as reaching out to them uh, throughout uh, this pandemic. And, 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 you know, we've been quite proud of that number in term, well, we're not proud until it's, uh, there's zero discrepancy, but at the same time, quite proud of what we've done over the, net, uh, over the past uh, uh, few months in that area. Uh, Dr. Levine, if you can, if you have more specifics on what we report to the CD, uh, CDC and what we can report to them. Thank you, Secretary Smith, and I hope this doesn't get too technical for anyone. Um, but our vaccine data team has known about this issue and discussed this issue with CDC on a very ongoing basis, and it's close to being resolved. It has to do with Vermont's immunization laws, prohibiting the health department from sharing immunization records unless they're for public health purposes in some summary or statistical form in which particular individuals are not identified. We collect data on race and ethnicity and we share the aggregate information, but CDC until now has been requiring patient level records to track vaccine coverage. So it is that issue that is um, conflicting with Vermont law. So basically, we can put things on our public dashboard in aggregate and uh, without risking any exposure of personal information. We've been discussing this with CDC about how we can submit our same information by a, a different mechanism in aggregate, and the word is that we're close to a resolution on that, but of course the article you were reading uh, couldn't know that um, and just represented us as being in the state that doesn't uh, do that. There are about seven, I think as Secretary Smith was saying, seven or eight states that are in similar predicaments. But don't let it, the take home message for everyone here is that we have done fantastic job with reporting race. Most states had big issues in the beginning of the pandemic because race was, even if it was on a form, the data was often not collected. And Vermont also had a problem with that, though not to the same extent. Um, the problem has been remedied tremendously. So it's not through a lack of data that this issue has come up. We would love to be as transparent as we can in aggregate with the data. Is that clear, Liam? Uh, yeah, thank you. I might have some follow-up, but I could do that offline and, and not take time here. Um, I think that'll do it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll try going back to Greg from the County Courier. Thank you, Jason. Good afternoon, Governor. I hope you can hear me this time. We can. Awesome. Uh, Governor, just a, a quick follow-up. Uh, you mentioned that when we get to 80% of qualified Vermonters, you will immediately lift uh, the restrictions. Do you mean that you will end the emergency order or will you just be uh, essentially wiping out the restrictions yeah. in that order? We'll, we'll essentially at that point uh, be lifting all the restrictions, but the emergency order will be um, within, let's say a couple of weeks of that. We're just, and it could be then, we're just making sure 
Um, we're working on that. Uh, uh, we'll be starting to work on that uh, over the next week or two to make sure that there is nothing left in there that we have to address in a different way um, to make sure that we uh, continue to get the information that is necessary or, or the funding that we need uh, to finish this off or the vaccination sites or whatever it is. Uh, there may be something within the emergency order that we need uh, for uh, a little bit longer to unwind this. So uh, we just want to be better safe than sorry, um, but it'll essentially be lifting all the restrictions. And, and ending the emergency order, but we may technically not do that on that day. Okay, and and again for clarity, the eighty percent number that is eighty percent of eligible Vermonters beginning their vaccination, not yes, uh, the the two week waiting period after that. Yes, it'll be whenever we we reach that twelve and over, eighty percent of the twelve and over population uh, with at least their first dose. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Thanks for coming back to me, Jason, and wish you both a happy weekend. Thank you. You too. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, uh, uh, this goal to get to 80 uh, percent, there's been a lot of uh, research that's been done that if, uh, if somebody who's hesitant about getting the vaccine, that if they talk to a doctor, even if it's not their own doctor, uh, that they it does increase the likelihood that they will go ahead and get a vaccine. Um, has there been any thought to doing an outreach where uh, Vermont places physicians in high traffic areas uh, offering to speak to anybody about getting a vaccine? Yeah, I, I, you know, interesting. I I saw there was a uh, something on the news uh, today. As a matter of fact, on on a forum uh, that they had with pediatricians. And I thought that that was quite powerful. And uh, but I'm gonna let Dr. Levine answer this because he's in contact with his fellow physicians. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor. So uh, I'll take this in pieces. So, so we've had um, about a dozen forums around the state since the 12 and older were allowed to get vaccine by the FDA. Um, we even started some of them before that was official, uh, just to get the ball rolling. Um, and that's made up of pediatricians from around the state and often, usually with a pediatrician that's well known within the community that uh, the forum's taking place on. Um, that's been really good for allowing people to air their concerns, get their questions answered, et cetera. The other aspect is obviously Vermont has one of the highest rates, if not the highest rate in the country, for people having a primary care uh, health care provider, physician, nurse practitioner, whatever. And um, all through this time, that community has been available to talk to their individual patients, even if they couldn't be the ones delivering the vaccine to them at that moment. In addition to that, beginning uh, two days ago, we've started uh, a very gradual process of having more vaccine available in the primary care community. This was more of a pilot early on because we need to have enough vaccine to do it on a bigger scale, and we're anticipating that will happen within weeks. So um, people can now actually get the vaccine from their own clinician if they've been waiting and holding on to that point. That will happen over these next several weeks. So the only thing we haven't done that you've mentioned um, is, you know, thinking about deploying physicians at some of these sites, if you will, that we're bringing vaccine to. I would have a, its own set of challenges, obviously, uh, because as you've seen on the slides, there are so many of those sites. Um, but there are healthcare professionals at many of these sites, like EMS. Um, and depending on where you go, there may be a public health nurse or a nurse associated with one, one, one of the healthcare networks or hospitals in the state. So there's been no shortage of opportunity to actually have a conversation with somebody in healthcare uh, who may be knowledgeable and respected by the, uh, the Vermonter who's there. I have to say uh, an anecdote. Um, got an email last night from a Vermonter that I've corresponded with previously who's on the verge of turning 80, 
and has been waiting for the vaccine in their healthcare provider's office. And I said to them, I'm really thinking, since you want the vaccine and the only thing you're waiting for is that familiar setting, that we can find a place for you to go. I really want you to get the vaccine now. You're in a vulnerable group. Uh, why wait any longer? And it just so happened, he emailed me last night saying he'd been to the pharmacy in his community and his favorite pharmacist was uh, actually present there and had one dose left of Johnson & Johnson. And he said, this is the time. And that's the way it went. And I'm hoping for many Vermonters, uh, they will uh, see that this is the time and there's no need to wait any longer. Uh, and they can even have that conversation with their health care provider ahead of time, uh, but still go to another site to get the vaccine once they feel comfortable with the concept of um, the fact that they are going to get it. Okay. Thank you, doctor. I, my only follow up on that would be that it seems, I don't have any data on this, but it seems we, we are now in Vermont into the statistics of people who are most hesitant for a lot of reasons which also may mean that they don't actually go to their doctor because they're, they may be uh, reticent for other reasons, just even talk to a doctor about it. So it seemed like an outreach piece where you wouldn't necessarily, where you're administering vaccines as much as you go to high traffic areas where there might be some volunteers who would say, I'm a doctor, um, if you, you know, happy to talk to you about the COVID vaccine. Um, but I certainly understand the outreach. It's been a great job by Vermont. Yeah, thank you. And if you use the New York Times article that recently came out looking at all the states and who's still left over in those states to get vaccine, who's been most hesitant, we have a very, very small percentage of Vermonters who don't believe in the pandemic or just don't believe in the vaccine and will never get it. Uh, that's a very, very small number. And a, and a less small but still pretty small number of Vermonters who have just said they didn't have the time, they needed to get off from work, they needed to be more convenient for them, or they've been just kind of watching to make sure everybody else is doing okay. So we have the answers for those audiences and you've seen them here at the press conference today. So um, I think we'll do very well in that regard. Uh, thank you. One last question, Governor, uh, did you ever hear back from anybody at the Senate on? Uh, the PPP forgiveness uh, loan tax? I believe that is in a bill that is going to be passed. So, yes, I believe that um, we're still wait and see, but I think that is has, has passed or is going to pass in the next uh, 24 hours. Very good. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. You too. Aaron Tanko, Jesse Digger. Aaron Patanko. All right, we'll move to Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Just a quick follow-up. I was wondering, it, it, you know, they asked about um, the PPP, but there's also the question about uh, taking 2020 out of the um, unemployment um, um, calculation. I, I was wondering if that ever came through. I didn't hear. Yes, I believe that is another bill that is is set to be passed. I think there's been a handshake on that. And so I believe that's in good shape. Okay. Um, you probably saw the uh, report from the DEC about uh, uh, carbon emissions going going down in Vermont. And uh, the utility, the electric utilities are asking for rate hikes, of course. So um, as, as the state transitions more to electricity and transportation and heating, are you concerned at all that, that we're going to face increasing electric rate hikes? Yeah, well, that'll be another challenge in the future. And I've always been concerned about rising utility rates, uh, electrical rates in particular, uh, and something that we've been you know, trying to uh, to address over the last four years. So yes, I, I guess the basic answer is I am uh, concerned about that in the future. Um, but we, uh, at least they're regulated and we have uh, different uh, opportunities uh, to make sure that we're 
keeping those as low as possible. Um, but I do think uh, there's going to be a changing world out there and that to where the investments that have been made in the past, uh, I think will be beneficial uh, to the future. And we'll have to do as much as we can to be as efficient as we possibly can while reducing our carbon emissions. I was I was surprised by the the actual reduction. Was that that's kind of uh, off guard a little bit? What, what was your take on the on the report? Yeah, I'm, I didn't. Uh, I, I saw the you know the the high points, uh, but I haven't read the article yet. Um, so um, you know the I, I, the pandemic had to have something uh, to do with that. Um, I do believe that we are going to, and I've said this uh, a lot, again, over the last three years, I'm very excited about what's happening in the transportation world with electric vehicles. I think uh, when I when I talked about this three years ago and seeing uh, President Biden, because I mentioned the F-150, I think, in one of my um, either budget addresses or state of the state, uh, and now it's being unveiled, and President Biden drove one. It looks just like a regular F-150, but uh, it, very, very different, full electric, and uh, this is the answer. You know, this is going to uh, be a, a continued um, path to less carbon emissions uh, that we've seen in the past due to transportation. Transportation uh, has about, I, I think, uh, in, by some measures, 60% of the carbon emissions are from transportation. So the sooner we can transition to uh, to electric vehicles, the better off we're going to be. Uh, and uh, we won't have to have things like carbon taxes at that point. So uh, again, I'm, uh, I, I think we're seeing uh, this uh, I, uh, supply and demand will take over. I think there'll be a lot of demand for uh, these types of vehicles. And, and the uh, market certainly has figured out uh, that they can capitalize on this. Are the are the incentives going to stick around? Do you think on you know the new vehicles and actually use vehicles too for like? I would I would say so for a bit, but then again, supply and demand and capitalism takes over, and and uh, pretty soon uh, people are competing for customers uh, for vehicles. And I I wouldn't see that there would be a need uh, then, but we're not there yet, and I know that the. Uh, infrastructure package uh, that the president has talked about has included, I believe, uh, incentives for electric vehicles uh, and other uh, areas of opportunity for uh, electric whatevers. So, um, again, I, I, we're not there yet, but um, but at some point, uh, and there will be a lot of competition in the uh, automotive and uh, transportation sector. All right, great. Thank you very much. And we'll try going back to Erin. I think she's on the line again. Matt Digger. Can you hear me? We can. Hi. Um, so I, I did some quick calculations, and it would be great if someone could confirm this, but at 80% of the eligible population vaccinated, it looks like that's about 70% of the total population of Vermont. Yeah, I think um, that's about anyone, right. Yeah, yes. Okay. That's about right. Um, you know, both estimates of herd immunity, which very seem to vary a lot, but they seem to be a little bit higher than that in like the 80% range, maybe 85%-ish. Are you concerned about the fact that we won't have like a herd immunity level by the time that all the restrictions are listed? Yeah, I, I think I better let Dr. Levine talk about herd immunity because I've heard actually – uh, lower uh, percentages than that, and I've I've heard the higher ones, so I don't know what to believe. All I know is that uh, Vermont is the leader in that category, I believe, uh, at this point in time. And if we hit this target of 80%, we will be uh, the leader. But Dr. Levine, yeah, Aaron, be because it's such a uh, a vague number for herd immunity. I've been purposely taking our focus off it and trying to just sort of ignore it in a sense because I let the data stand for itself. And all the data I showed today and that we've talked about every week here, and that's happening now across the country in places where they have far less robust vaccination rates than we do, is showing that the impact of vaccine has been substantial. And I think we should just use that as the take-home message 
I would say that um, if we do get to 80 percent, or when we do get to 80 percent, and if that was 70 percent of the population, um, we're clearly showing that that's substantial. And then if you could add into that what will almost certainly happen either by the fall or in the beginning of 2022, which is vaccine available to those younger than 12, um, we will certainly, uh, again, be at a very robust level of immuniz immunization and get to that kind of herd immunity number you're looking for. So I would just say that uh, let's not focus on that so much. Uh, focus on the fact that uh, if any state's going to achieve herd immunity, it is us. And whether the number be 80% uh, determines herd immunity or 85% or what have you, we're going to be very, very close to that, if not surpass that. So um, we won't focus on the number for herd immunity as much as how meaningful it will be that 80% of eligible Vermonters actually have been vaccinated. Well, uh, uh, kind of a related but, but separate question from whether we reach herd immunity or not. I mean, what evidence do we have that 70% of the population vaccinated is safe to open all COVID restrictions? I mean, do we, do we know that it will prevent um, transmission from occurring or outbreaks from spreading among that 30% of the population that still hasn't gotten any shots? You know, if the data that I just presented about the nursing home experience, uh, which is the most vulnerable population, is any indicator, the answer is yes. Um, the goal is uh, suppression of the virus. And suppression of the virus means that it's just being passed so infrequently from person to person that it keeps reaching dead ends. And the more dead ends it reaches, the less we're going to see of it. Uh, even uh, if we're at 70% of the total population. So that's really what we're trying to do. We're recognizing that even in very vulnerable settings, uh, a high vaccination rate of the residents still leads to uh, really good immunity and low case rates even in those who were unvaccinated in that setting. We should go with that. If we want to have something to worry about, we should worry more about the world than the state of Vermont, uh, because uh, the world is lagging behind, as you know, with getting vaccination, uh, especially to less developed nations. And thank goodness the, the current administration has tried to increase our contribution to that, but it really needs to be a worldwide contribution to that, and it needs to be very much uh, done uh, with haste. So. Uh, those are the numbers we should focus on uh, going towards the future, how the rest of the world is doing and how quickly can we give them vaccine uh, because our country is reaching the point where we're using less than we were originally and there's probably more being manufactured than we need to use here alone. I mean, the evidence certainly points towards vaccines mm -hmm. needing to lower face counts generally, but. Um, is there a benchmark or, or a, would you change your outlook if case counts were to rise is, is essentially what I, my question. Oh, believe me, we're not stopping following any data. Even if I don't want to show you those slides anymore uh, in the future, it doesn't mean we're not going to follow data as closely and as frequently as we do. So we will know if anything changes. But I would be very, very surprised if things change at this point in time. Um, the, all of the trends are going uh, very dramatically and consistently in the same direction. Uh, so, and again, my goal here is suppress the virus significantly so that when we do reach the fall and winter and respiratory viruses of all sorts get passed from people to people, we'll see much less of that. Thank you. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Guy Page. All right, we'll move to Cat WCAX. Okay. 
Uh, Governor, at least five Vermont private colleges will require student vaccination for COVID-19 for the fall semester. What is the likelihood that Vermont's public universities and public K-12 schools also will require vaccination this fall? Yeah, I, I don't know is that will be the case uh, for public schools, K through 12, um, by me, by public, are you talking about the state colleges? Uh, yes. Yeah. State, I, with the K through 12 and also the state colleges and UVM. Yeah. Uh, UVM, I believe, has already said that they are going to be requiring their students uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, I'm not sure about the state colleges uh, at this point. Um, and uh, I think like Middlebury has said both uh, uh, staff mm -hmm. and students. Uh, so, and uh, in fact, I, I saw, I think the 280 uh, seems to come to mind, 280 institutions in the Northeast uh, have required this. So I don't know about the state colleges at this point, um, but we can look, the, we can find that out for you. But I don't, I don't see a path uh -huh. where we're going to be requiring um, students in the K through 12, unless uh, oh. anything. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm going to. Uh, also, Governor, are you aware that a supporter of Vermont Liberty, uh, the group started by John Clark, was beaten and pepper sprayed after a Vermont Liberty event on the State House lawn on Saturday? And, and do you have any any comments or thoughts about it? Um, I wasn't aware of what group it was, but I did hear that there was uh, there was a situation, and uh, you know, regardless of our points of view, uh, regardless of of, um, of our strong uh, viewpoints, uh, it shouldn't result in uh, a physical altercation. And so I condemn uh, anything physical of that nature. Again, peaceful, civil um, disagreement is fine. And, uh, and civil uh, protests is fine, uh, but it should not uh, it should not devolve into a, a physical confrontation. So I condemn the, the action by whoever did it. Thank you. Cat WCX. Hi, these questions are for Dan French. After the restrictions are lifted, and if it's while the school year is still going, will students still need to mask up? Yeah, thanks for the question, Kat. We're having those conversations. Um, you know, I do meet weekly with the Superintendents Association, so we were discussing yesterday um, how, how the end of the year might go relative to this issue. Um, so we don't have all the answers to that yet, um, but I'm confident we'll, you know, we'll be able to plan our way through it. We've, we've uh, as I mentioned in my comments today, uh, had to plan through some infinitely more complex issues than this one. So I know we'll get there, but we're, we're still working on it. As schools develop their recovery plans, many seem to be leaning on summer school. Is this going to be adequate for making up for the learning loss, especially if enrollment levels are low and districts can't find enough teachers? That's a great question. Um, you know, our recovery planning framework has three focus areas. Uh, learning loss or academics is one. Uh, the other two are so social, emotional well-being and re-engagement. Um, we've, I think, very intentionally with our Summer Matters campaign, uh, see the summer really being about that re-engagement piece. And I would argue at this point in the recovery process, it is sort of the essential precondition by which we would address the other two areas. Meaning that our first step is to re-engage with our students, um, particularly this summer. Uh, we'd like to see all Vermont students uh, involved, whether it be a job, uh, in a summer camp, uh, in, a, in a summer activity, what have you. Um, it's really about engagement, this piece, uh, because that's going to be the essential sort of first step to uh, understand uh, what their learning loss is, but certainly to understand where they're coming from from an anxiety or social emotional uh, well being perspective. So, in making up that learning loss, what is the education agency's position on having students repeat a grade level as some states are mandating? Yeah, we don't have such a regulatory mandate approach at the state level in Vermont. Uh, the issues of retention and promotion are a local uh, school board uh, issue. Um, at this point, I think for most districts, again, it's very premature. Uh, we first have to understand to what extent there is learning loss. And in order to do that, we first have to reestablish our connection with our students. Um, so I think that'll be an ongoing conversation 
uh, in the fall. Uh, but at this this point, the priority is uh, you know really ending the year on a celebratory note, uh, engaging with our students over the summer, uh, so we can uh, start to begin to understand um, how they've been affected by the pandemic, both academically and from a social emotional standpoint. Thank you. You're welcome. Devin Bates, Local 22, Local 44. Yeah, hi. Question for Governor Scott, as we're getting toward the end of the legislative session here, um, what are your thoughts on what Vermont lawmakers were able to do um, throughout the totality of the session? I know there's some recent bills like H360, the broadband bill, that um, isn't quite investing what you had been hoping for. But when you stand back and look at, you know, the, the unique situation of this session, very consequential, doing it entirely remotely, um, what do you think about what the legislature was and wasn't able to get done for Vermonters? Yeah, well, again, it was a new frontier for all of us on uh, trying to get through this legislative session. And uh, I think they did uh, uh, well. Uh, and I think they, uh, and I appreciate all that they've done, especially in the last couple of weeks, uh, to come to agreement with some of our provisions. Um, I will say, uh, I just want to reiterate, the $150 million uh, of uh, the broadband bill, um, that was, you know, right in line with what we were thinking for the first year. Uh, my uh, my approach had been uh, because we had three years to spend this money that we're receiving from Congress, ARPA money, uh, was a, a little over a billion dollars. Uh, and one of the buckets that I said I'd like to to make sure that we reserve um, 250 million uh, for broadband. Uh, now, in their intent language in the in the bill, it's not quite passed yet, uh, but I think it'll be taken up uh, this afternoon in the Senate and the in the House. It may be even be taking uh, being taken up right now in the Senate. Um, but they had made mention of their uh, of of what their intent is, uh, and 250 million uh, is uh, intended to be used for broadband. So we're in agreement on that, and I just want to make sure that everyone understands we didn't. Uh, we didn't see that we could spend $250 million in the first year, uh, but we want to make sure that we spend at least $250 million over the next uh, two to three years uh, to get broadband uh, to, uh, to all areas of the state. All right. Thanks for that clarification. Have a good weekend. You too. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, with the 80% goal for lifting restrictions, uh, there likely will be some parts of the state, uh, and I'm uh, referring especially to the Northeast Kingdom, that will be uh, far short of that vaccination rate when the state hits it as a whole. I'm wondering if, if you have any concerns about what easing restrictions uh, in those areas may mean uh, if they are still lagging quite far behind. Yeah, it's not a perfect system. It's not a perfect uh, system when you look across the country either. Um, we're one of the better performing states, if not the best uh, performing states. And we have other states that are, you know, half of where we are. Um, so that's a concern uh, regardless of where you go and what you do. Um, I will say um, that uh, we're not going to stop vaccinating people uh, when we uh, lift all the restrictions or uh, cease with the uh, emergency order. We're going to continue uh, to set up clinics, uh, advocate for people to get uh, their uh, vaccination, and continue to try and meet them where they are. And that includes the Northeast Kingdom. So uh, this isn't over uh, by any uh, means, but uh, but I believe at that, that point when we, when we uh, hit 80%, the majority of people will be protected. And it'll be up to the other 20% to protect themselves. And they should continue to wear masks and protect themselves and distance themselves from, from others who are not vaccinated. I mean, it's as simple as that. But uh, we'll uh, continue to provide uh, guidance and, and opportunities uh, for them to be vaccinated. OK, thank you very much. Joseph Gresser, The Barton Chronicle. Um, hello. I am curious. Um, I remember when the issue of fraud 
in um, the unemployment uh, claims came up, there was uh, a question of whether the state would be able to hold people whose accounts had been uh, fraudulently uh, had claims submitted against them and been paid out harmless. And uh, I just wonder whether the federal uh, officials who were asked about this have come up with a reply, and if so, if it's been satisfactory. Uh, Commissioner Harrington. So um, if the claim is specifically identified as fraud, um, then there is no problem with holding individuals harmless. I think that the question, if I remember back uh, to when it was originally asked, also included some, some other caveats in there about overpayments due to a variety of different circumstances. So um, to the question today about if it's been identified clearly as um as imposter fraud or someone using uh, a stolen identity to file, then the actual individual is held harmless. Good. Um, and one more question. Um, Dr. Levine earlier was speaking about um, vaccination in the rest of the world. And while I understand the moral imperative. Uh, I'm curious as to whether Dr. Levine sees a, uh, a practical reason to make sure that uh, people uh, who have not had the opportunity to be vaccinated for you know, financial or other reasons around the world uh, to be able to uh, get access to the vaccine. So you're right, there's a moral and ethical reason, there's also a practical reason, and there's a selfish reason, all wrapped up together. Um, first of all, when you look at what's going on in India and in some parts of Africa, um, it's tragic, absolutely tragic. Um, the uh, devastation of life um, that's occurring there. Uh, so we should all feel um, that getting vaccine is an appropriate response uh, to prevent that from happening in even more places. Um, practically speaking, though, um, and it's a little bit selfish, but it's the way we are now. This is a pandemic. This is a global enterprise. Look at what happens in India now. There's a new variant that has been discovered in India that's accounting for a high percentage of their cases. That variant is reportedly even more transmissible than the B117, which was the UK variant. Some in the UK believe this variant in India is actually um, more um, likely to cause severe illness or even death. The point of the matter is, the more the virus can thrive, no matter where it is in the world, the more it can be transmitted from person to person, the more it can mutate, as viruses do, and the more variant strains, like this new one I'm commenting on, can develop. And a variant developing in India might as well be developing right here in the United States because people are traveling all the time. And that's how we, in fact, got the, va the virus in the first place in the United States, through travel. So bottom line is, it's better off for us in Vermont, for us in the United States, and for everyone in the whole world if we can have a unified response to the virus, not in a piecemeal fashion, but really aggressively provide vaccine as widely as possible so the virus can no longer be transmitted and mutate and perhaps cause worse variant strains that could come back to impact us. That's the simple answer. Well, thank you. Michael, BC Digger. 
Hi, thank you. Uh, Governor, you were talking to Dedden about the uh, accomplishments of the legislature this year. And I wanted to ask specifically about the leadership. Uh, this is the first uh, session for the new speaker and pro tem. And I wonder, how would you characterize your working relationship with them? And uh, how did you find their approach to leading their chambers? Yeah, no, I think they've done a, a great job in their first year. And uh, I, I appreciate uh, the, what we, you know, the frankness of our conversations. We meet often, um, at least every other week, sometimes uh, every week. And um, it's been it's been a good dialogue, good discussion, very open, and they uh, they adhere to their word, and everything's been working fine. We don't agree on everything, uh, but we're we're honest about that, and we are able to talk about that. So I think they've done very well in their first year. As somebody who's served in the legislature, I wonder, uh, you know, but. Uh, how, how would you characterize kind of their approach to leadership in each of their chambers from, from what you've seen as an observer? Yeah, hard, hard to know um, because especially uh, in the situation we find ourselves in with, with this remote legislating, it's not the same thing. Uh, so I don't get to see it. Uh, and, and I think that we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, it, I don't know if it would be more challenging or less challenging uh, when we all get back in person, but it will be something that we can we can look at and compare to a known that we can compare to. Very difficult under these circumstances, and that's why I give them high marks, uh, because for all the legislators in some respects and uh, the advocates and, and, uh, and Vermonters in general for you know, having to work their way through this in a di whole different environment. So um, it has been easy for anyone, and certainly not for leadership in the House and the Senate, but, um, but I give them high marks for how they've been able to accomplish this and uh, look forward to getting back in person uh, in the next session. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you again on Tuesday.